Hi, everyone. It's Raghu, and I'm back with another edition of Mind Rolling. And this time around, I get to chat with Adia Shanti, a wonderful teacher who I was so supremely happy to spend time with. He's really a delight. Uh, but before we get into that, just a little bit of an introduction around that, I wanted to uh, highlight something really wonderful uh, around the 1440 multiversity and the fact that uh, coming up in October of uh, 2018, there is a workshop with none other than Alanis Morissette, who is a tremendously substantial deep being who's doing this workshop there that you can find all about, all about it on go to 1440.org. And, uh, yeah, we just really appreciate our partnership with 1440, and, and I like to highlight some of the wonderful teachers and uh, thought leaders that they have sharing these workshops in this beautiful campus out near Santa Cruz, so please check it out. And also, uh, and when we're talking about Adya Shanti, the book that I use to, as a premise or as uh, talking points to talk, talk to him about is called Falling into Grace. And uh, that is available in our ramdas.org shop. So go to ramdas.org and go into the shop. It's a great way. There's so many wonderful things there. But I'm suggesting you pick up this book because uh, if, uh, if there's anything that I'm most appreciative of is the down-to-earth sharing that many of our guests uh, do on Mind Rolling, and uh, Adia is just uh, the epitome of that. Just straightforward, down-to-earth ways in which we can get our lives in balance and get out of the movie of me, which we've been talking about a lot, uh, and this uh, idea, this chat with Adia goes a long way towards that and his book. So you can pick that book up, Falling Into Grace. Go to ramdas.org and go into the shop. Uh, yeah, so uh, I just really enjoyed this uh, time with Adia. And um, so Falling Into Grace. So I, I found a little passage that uh, really explains or suggests what we're talking about grace. He said, we let go into grace. It's something we fall into. Like when we fall into the arms of another. Or we put our head on the pillow to go to sleep. It's a willingness to relax, even in the midst of tension. It's a willingness to stop for just a moment. To breathe. To notice that there's something else going on other than the story our mind is telling us. Remember that story of movie of me? In this moment of grace, we see that whatever might be there in our experience, from the most difficult emotional challenges to the most causeless joy, occurs within a vast space of peace, of stillness, of ultimate well-being. Eh? I thought that was just such a direct hit on um, the way that we can open ourselves to the grace that is just self-evident in this universe, if only we could let go of the movie of me. And further, I love the analogy around uh, of, of grace uh, that um, when it rains and you stand outside in the rain, if you cup your hands, of course, you will collect a pool of rainwater. But if you don't, you're just going to get wet. And putting your hands together is the practice. And uh, Maharaj used to tell us all the time, you do practice, spiritual practice, and wait for grace. So that's pretty much what is the most efficacious way of dealing with our day-to-day, -day, especially around being open and being in spacious awareness. And if we carry that through uh, all the various aspects of our lives and our relationships, grace will be there. That doesn't mean it's all going to be fun times either, as we well know. So um, here's this just uh, uh, 
I have to say that this uh, chat that I had with Adya is one of my favorites uh, that I've done in a while. And I have been lucky to really hang out with some extraordinarily gifted people. And uh, certainly Adya is one of those. So here you go, Adya Shanti. And this is Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network. See you next week. Hi, everyone. It's Mind Rolling, and uh, we're part of the Be Here Now Network, and we are being here now with Adya Shanti, who I've never met. I'm so happy to meet you, Adya. Thank you, Raghu. It's nice to be on the program with you. Yeah. So, I don't know if I need to do any big introductions with no, Adya. You- no, <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. But I'm just a ha- I'm just a guy that happens to be talking to you at the moment. How yes, that? Yeah. yes. Two guys in a chat, and this is absolutely perfect. But I will say one thing, though. Uh, one of uh, what we try and do at the network, and particularly, of course, on mind rolling, is bring whatever it is we've gotten through these various lineages that we've all been. Um, aware of and working with uh, over past many, many decades and bring it into a practical and as you call it in one of your books, fundamental uh, way to uh, realize that uh, there is a way to be free, if we can just put it in the most simple terms. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm really happy to have you, Anja, because I'm not somebody I haven't uh, seen you and and been at any of the talks, but I'm familiar with a couple of the books Mm -hmm. and it's exactly what it is that I think our audience would uh, absolutely love to hear. So uh, I think a good place to get started uh, is um, I think for everybody is, is your book falling into grace. I really think that that's uh, uh, really can give people an idea of uh, what it is that we are made up of and the interior questioning and and how that can really help us to transcend some of the stuff is very difficult. And I think I can, if you don't mind, and I know you've probably told this story many, Mm -hmm. many, many times, but just a little bit about how you, when you were growing up and I I love the part where you're growing up and you're looking at all these adults and going, what what is going on here? yeah. There's so much suffering and angry and God knows what. And uh, yeah, just talk a little about it, how you call it. You, you eventually figured out that they were insane. That's, yeah. that's, that's right. That's what kind of saved me. It's, got, um, it's funny since I've told that story when I was a kid, maybe, you know, my memory isn't the greatest. So somewhere between probably eight and 10 years old or eight and 11 years old, I, it, it just occurred to me, like, what's going on with this? adult world. And keep in mind, I, I grew up in a relatively normal, relatively healthy family. I, I didn't know till I started to teach how lucky I was. You know, I had parents that cared for me and loved for me. And, you know, like all of us, they had their imperfections, but they were really dedicated to, to, to the kids and to, the, to each other. And so, but even with that, you know, and watching the adult world, it always, there was a lot of things that just seemed to not add up to me. I think, you know, I'm like most kids, we're much more perceptive than the adults think we are. You know, we're, 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 we're paying more attention than people think we are. And so that was, became one of my questions. Like, gee, the adult world seems to be odd that in the sense that they put, seem to put so much energy into things that cause so much difficulty for themselves and for others as well. And so this became like one of my kind of a, a deep wondering, I guess you would say. And then one day it just sort of popped into my mind out of the blue, which for me came as a great relief, which was, I just thought, okay, now I get it. They're crazy. (laughs) 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 And um, it's funny since I've told that stories over, over the years to different groups, how many people have told me they had the, the same insight, the same kind of understanding as a kid, and unfortunately, the vast majority of them tell me that they had that insight. They either concluded that there was something wrong with them, which was the normal kind of conclusion, because after all, these are, the, your, these are your gods. These are the people you depend yeah. on. You yeah. know? Um, but it seems like it's not an unusual thing for children to come upon. Yeah. And 
I, I'm just thinking back, and in my case, I, I encountered it uh, pretty similarly, except that I, I did what you just described. Okay, something's wrong here, and it's got to be you know, me. What am I doing? Uh, just the constant self-talk around um, judging, basically. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I wish I would have said, Jesus, these people are nuts. <laughs> eventually I did. Eventually I did, but a little too late on some yeah. level. I'd like to say that I, that I didn't eventually become one of them. But <laughs> <laughs> as often happens, I, I kind of forgot this little insight as a kid. And you know how we do. We get encultured into the, into the same sort of unconsciousness in a way that everybody else does. And then we seek to crawl our way back out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, but tell, I just continue the story a little bit. And as you got into an interest to say, to find a way, like many of us did back in the day, mm -hmm. to uh, transcend uh, this uh, objective suffering and subjective suffering, basically. Yeah, yeah. My, my path was a, it was a little bit unusual, uh, Raghu, in the sense that Probably in my late teens, maybe 20, around 20 years old, I, read, I was reading a book by Alan Watts on <laughs> Zen. Don't remember the title. And, um, and I didn't know what drew it to me. I didn't know, you know, it was my, kind of my first spiritual book that I'd ever really read. And I sat down and I was reading and I read, read the word enlightenment. And it was like a nuclear explosion went off in my, in my mind, even in my body. And I didn't know why. I didn't, like, what's this enlightenment thing? Why did I just have such an overwhelming response to a mere word? It was so powerful that I somehow knew, even though I didn't understand it, I knew that I'd just taken a fork in the road in, in my life. And that whatever my life was, it was never going to be the same. Somehow I had, I had, sort of gotten off on an exit or an entry, however you want to look at it. And so that became my obsession. What is this thing called enlightenment? And so it kind of dovetailed into that, into that understanding as a child, like that, you know, oh, the adult world has a fair amount of craziness in it um, and the suffering that comes. And then that coupled with this strange and unusual, I call it an intrusion. Um, because it was like an intrusive experience that, that mm -hmm. came. And I spent years literally walking down the sidewalk, going to work in downtown Palo Alto. Um, and I would ask myself on a daily basis, almost like a mantra, like, what is this? What is this? I felt like something got inside of me, even physically, and I could feel where it was. And it felt like a kind of like an alien, you know? Um, and I, I just wondered, like, what happened to me? What... <laughs> Why am I obsessed with this? Um, so in that sense, the, the, the strangeness of, of that was that I didn't know it was unusual, but most people, I think the, the vast majority seem to come to spirituality through the gateway of a lot of suffering, a lot of personal suffering and a deep desire to, to not want to continue suffering for the rest of their life sort of needlessly. And of course, I had suffered. I mean, we all suffer in life, no matter what it is. I'd have my ups and downs. And, um, and, and so that was there and sort of the background, but it wasn't the driving force. The driving force was this sort of intrusive experience of the numinous that just showed up, you know, for, for a reason that I didn't even understand. Mm. And it'd be good to, just to finish this off, really, the... Uh a very, very specific experience or incident, however you want to call it, that happened at 20 after you had been sitting and doing yeah. sitting meditation for a number of years. Yeah, that happened at 25. And the funny thing was that in my late teens, starting probably 15 or 16, I started to have this intuition. And it was more than an intuition. I just somehow was absolutely certain that on my 25th year, I was going to die. And the thing that seemed strange to me about that was not only that, how do I have this intuition? Why does it seem so true to me? But I would even think about, now, why am I not more concerned about this? Because I wasn't concerned about it. And of course, I thought it was some sort of physical death that was going to occur. So 
you know, lo and behold, on my 25th year after undergoing probably four, four or five, probably about four years of serious spiritual practice, lots and lots of meditation, winding myself up into such a tight knot, you know, that <laughs> something was either going to break loose or my mind was just going to break down, you know, something was going to happen. I had mm -hmm. sort of driven myself so hard and, and sure enough, I sat down in my meditation hut that I had in my backyard and, and, and it just sort of hit me all at once as things sometimes do, you know, it, it hit me like a freight train and I just realized that I couldn't do this. I couldn't make the breakthrough happen that I wanted to. I, I always look back on it as a, a moment of utter and total defeat. And I literally said in my mind, I can't do this. And no sooner did I say that than a sort of, another sort of very explosive experience happened. Um, I guess they would call it a, a Kundalini kind of awakening. That's how it started. And before I knew it, within seconds, my heart was beating and mm. my lungs were breathing. And I had been a very competitive um, cyclist. So I knew what a maximum heart rate felt like. And I knew that this was way past that. <laughs> and I just, at one point, I was just like, okay, this is either going to stop or it's going to kill me. And then the second strange discovery was kind of my, from my guts. It came, literally came from my guts up and then hit my brain. It didn't originate in my brain, but it came up and it hit my brain. And the, the thought that I had was, is okay, if this is what it takes for me to discover what this enlightenment thing is, I'll die today. And it wasn't, you know, matcha, it wasn't male, it wasn't um, courageous in the conventional sense. I had already been doing all that. It was just like, somehow I had discovered it was just true. It was just true. And it was simple. And I, I was willing, and I thought that it was going to kill me. But as soon as that arose, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm willing to die today. I guess this is going to be it. And, you know, like snapping your fingers, the whole experience stopped. It really it threw me out of my body is what happened. Mm -hmm. It threw me right out of my body, right up out the top of my head and into a whole different sort of dimension of experience. Mm. And um, yeah. Radical perception. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Twist. Yeah. I mean, when I finally sort of came back from it, I don't know how long it happened, but I was, mm. I can't even say I, cause I don't have any, I didn't have any sense of myself, but, um, that just a complete nothingness, not a problem, but a total nothingness. And I had it, during that, I did have the experience that somehow like hundreds of insights per second was being almost like downloaded into my system. And a few of them I could catch a glimpse of and understand what they were, but the vast majority, overwhelming majority, I didn't even, they were too, too many too fast. And they were just being sort of downloaded into me. Mm. And that happened for a while. And then at a certain point that was over. And at some point I was sort of back in my body and everything was very quiet and calm. And, and, um, I just, it just seemed like the only thing to do was to get up. So I got <laughs> up and I bowed to my little Buddha figure and somewhere between the bottom of the bow and me raising my head, I was in absolute hysterical laughter. <laughs> And what I, I'm, this is, this is exactly the words that I thought. And I was looking at that little Buddha figure up on my altar. And I thought, you little bastard, I've chased you. You've driven me completely insane for four years now. And here I discover that you are me and I am you. Mm -hmm. And it was just seemed like the most ridiculous thing in the world, you know, in a beautiful sense, in a lovely sense. But um, still, it was just, it just seemed like overwhelmingly funny until I then turned around at some point and opened the door and all of a sudden it went from being funny to kind of just sublime, you know, it was mm. just like seeing God everywhere. Mm. And, you know, I was just kind of in a state of awe for quite a while. Mm. So that was the first, that was my, that was the first breakthrough that I had, mm. you know, kind of a, a, a grace, right? I mean, because obviously I had failed 
<laughs> it didn't happen. The I failed. Of me. Yeah. It happened in spite of me. Yeah. Oh my. You know, one of Ram Dass's main things these last couple of years mm -hmm. that he loves to share with people is uh, the the moving from egoic consciousness to spiritual heart soul consciousness mm -hmm. via his phrase i am loving awareness mm -hmm. so I, i'm going to tell him about this and go yeah no adya he did exactly you know or what happened to him was exactly what you're telling people to do nowadays mm -hmm. it's just become loving awareness in that mm -hmm. moment That's, yeah which i think is a wonderful pointer yeah yeah. yeah. Um, so, Grace, and one of the things, now you're known as, I mean, this is all just mental formulations, as a non-dual teacher. Yeah, um, I've kind of got thrown in the heat. You did get thrown <laughs> in that heat, you know. <laughs> and now we, um, I mean, I'm not sure how much you know, but our, our lineage with uh, Maharaji and Karoli Baba and what between... Ram Das, Krishnas, and others of us who have brought this back to yeah. to America. I know Ram Das's story. Yeah, well, that's pretty much all of our story. He really uh -huh. represents, and and the bottom line is that Maharaji certainly, uh, actually, the best way to actually identify it is when we went to this temple in the Himalayas where Ninkaroli Baba was, and you walk through the gate. It's not there anymore, but the inscription was. Uh, uh, Param Puja Advait Neem Karoli Baba Hanuman Temple. Mm -hmm. Advait. Yeah. It's on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and in our whole process with him, and he, he didn't teach particularly, I mean, he said lots of different things that were, yeah. we have as one, you know, love, serve, love everyone, serve everyone, and remember God, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but somehow we did end up doing Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. We did end up spending, many of us, spending a, a lot of time with the uh, great Tibetan teachers and so on. So there seemed to be something there where that, um, the Advait, or, or it wasn't something that we consciously practiced or anything, but it, was def it is definitely part of what, who we are in a, in a very strange way. But still, lo it, looking at um, this particular book, Falling into Grace, and then I just got a. I read this passage, and I, I want to read it if you don't mind, just so people get an idea. Beyond even any teaching, though, and this is from Aja, the aspect of spiritual life that is the most profound is the element of grace. Grace is something that comes to us when we somehow find ourselves completely available, when we become open-hearted, and open-minded and are willing to entertain the possibility that we may not know what we think we know. In this gap of not knowing is the suspension of any conclusion, a whole other element of life and reality can rush in. This is what I call grace. This is that moment of aha, aha, a moment of recognition when we realize something that previously we never could quite imagine and and this is at the very beginning it's kind of to me it it's not a contradiction to advite uh but it is um it is a way that it opens it up and for me who's been in the bhakti tradition all these years yeah. but uh, uh, you know this is any of any books that i read or any studies that i do would be more along the tibetan version of reality which i think is pretty solid and so this idea of grace that you bring into this uh, in that way, I, I just, uh, it's a powerful uh, teaching. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about how, yeah. I mean, that moment for you was grace. I mean, absolutely. Thank you. Um, it was, it was grace. And I think that, you know, that, that statement, it, it comes from a lot of, you know, spiritual hard knocks, I guess you could say, that were really condensed into a relatively short period of time. Looking back, of course, at the time, like four years seems like an eternity when you're in your early 20s. But, um, but like I said, I, I had the mindset of a very highly competitive athlete. And so Zen really made sense to me, right? It's, it's oriented around self-effort and 
doing it yourself and not, you know, it's not relying on anything, not even the teacher. And so it, it really, you know, it, it fit me. It fit my conditioning well. Um, and I'm not saying that this is Zen's problem because it's much more profound than, than the way I'm just stating it. But that part of it is, it fit me. But of course, that was the part of me that had to be, um, that I had to get beyond. And so it was like a dance that I had to dance all the way out. And that's not pretty. And it doesn't look profound when you're doing it because mostly you're failing, but only over and over and over and over and over. And yet there is something about, about that, um, that engagement, you know, it's like wrestling with a dragon that you can't defeat. And then one day you just let it defeat you. You know, that's kind of what happened. And that was, that was the first time that I really, you know, got in my bones. I mean, I'd heard the word grace and stuff, but really got in my bones like, yeah, this is, this is an intimate part of spirituality is the confrontation with what you can't make happen. And we have an, an innate distaste of that very idea. Especially in the West, no? Especially in the West, yeah, where we're so sort of hyper-rational and competitive and achievement-oriented yeah. and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, so so from, you know, from that time at 25, um, you know, of course, I still had plenty of, of, uh, of openings to come and clarifications and life experience and all that. But from that moment at 25, I never struggled again um, in this terms of this effortful trying to, trying to storm the gates of heaven. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just saw that, that that wasn't the way to go about it. That was, not only was it not necessary, but it's counterproductive in a certain sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So grace became from that moment on, I kind of got in my blood and bones what, how important grace was, you know, and yet we, and yet it doesn't mean that, that, you know, we just then cop out and say, well, I'm going to just wait for grace. I think there is a way that we need to participate and really throw ourselves into our spirituality, really bring ourselves completely to the plate and yet not be trying to forcibly make things happen. It's, it's a kind of intricate little balance game. Yeah. I think that yeah. we all, we all, we all learn one way or another, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Super important actually riding that edge of, of effort and grace. I mean, we could do probably a couple of podcasts just on that. Um, and, uh, a lot of the effort is the mind trying to override the heart. Mm. It's, try, it's trying to lead and think it needs to lead. And that includes the personal will and all of that, where the, the mind needs to sink down into the heart. It's, it's not going to override the heart, really. Not successfully, not yeah. forever. It, it, yeah. really needs, it really needs to sink down into the heart. At mm. least I see it. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, now, a little story, uh, you know, Sharon Salzberg, I think you know who yeah. she is. And mm -hmm. So I was doing a panel with her and a man named, uh, a comedian actually named Duncan Trussell, who's just this wonderful guy who's got us turned on to podcasts and it's why the Be Here Now Network actually exists and everybody, Sharon including, is doing podcasts now. Mm -hmm. um, and he's you know somebody who really represents people in a and talk about wanting practical information so yeah. he says to sharon one day you know sharon what do you do when you get up what what's your practice and she said duncan i get up i sit down on my mat and i get real mm -hmm. from that little moment we have started to really investigate what are we talking about here getting real what are we talking about and uh and the first thing we have to address is is certainly what's in the beginning part of of this book that uh you know uh, around the things the stories we tell ourselves the belief system that we have around what we think and so on which i think would be invaluable to share at this time um just talking about the egoic consciousness and how that's developed 
and and affected you know and and that you also have a, a chapter on generational the generational effect and what's handed down and boy you know i can sure. relate with that one so yeah just talking can you talk a little bit about how we set ourselves up to believe in that thing so strongly me the me yeah yeah well that's where that's we're oriented to do that right by our culture and our family and you know to establish to establish a self and that's there's that's fine. There's not a problem with that. In fact, the, the stronger stronger in the sense of more whole and healthy that self is or that ego is, the better. Um, and yet, uh, we're not really told about its profound limitations. We're not really told like, hey, this thing you're creating isn't actually you. It's more like a a useful vehicle. Why not? <laughs> and, it's, and it's good to have a functional vehicle rather than one that's breaking down all the time. But, but that's what it is. And sure, what seems to hold a lot of it together, I mean, there's many, many factors, but is a lot of the beliefs and conclusions that we came to through the experience of growing up. You know, and we, have a, we came to a lot of some of those Conclusions are obvious in the sense that are mental beliefs that we can connect with when we start to inquire and at, just look at our fundamental beliefs. You know, just number one is think of thinking of ourself in terms of a self. Um, but also there's a lot of sort of emotional conclusions that get made. And those aren't, the, those are also at, at, at the bottom, there's a conceptual component, but they're they're primarily experienced as all sorts of forms of emotional reactivity and sticking points. And, um, and those are actually kind of emotion, belief in the form of emotion, you know, and emotion blockages. So one of the things that I think is so useful to look at is whenever you feel yourself in conflict with, with what's happening with, with yourself, with life, with God, um, with your partner, whoever, whatever it might happen to be. But that's kind of a way that like life is giving you this built in biological signal that when you start to feel, feel that, that, that internal conflict and division, it's as if life is saying, Hey, take a look again. You may be looking at this through a lens, through a conceptual lens. That's, that's not really as real as you think it is. And, you know, that's easy to say, isn't it? You know, it's, it's simple and easy to say, but to really get down there and start to notice that, you know, that most of our experience is actually derived from the way we've packaged life and ourselves and the conclusions we've made and the beliefs of them and, you know, the whole, the whole package. I think a lot of spirituality is, is actually just dissecting you know, one assumption after the other, after another, after another. And it's not just the ones that cause suffering. It's all of them have to be open. You know, even the most spiritual ones, even the ones we, we like and appreciate the most, they have to at least be held up to a kind of contemplative scrutiny, mm. I think. Because yeah. that's what provides the crack, you know, the crack in the sort of cosmic egg of our consciousness. Mm. Um. You, you, you talk about something that I never really thought about um, that uh, once I got a handle on it, I thought, wow, yeah, this is truly something for us to think about. And that's the, uh, you call the shadow side of language mm -hmm. uh, and how, how that affects. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think uh, maybe not many people have thought quite about this in the way that you have expressed it. Yeah. Um well, I, it, since I wrote the book a while ago, I, if, if I don't mention what you're looking for, you can always remind me, but yeah, yeah. I can tell you what comes to my mind now is that the, the shadow side of language, of course, you know, language is, is from, for a very long time, it's been thought of as a sort of, di, of, a, of a divine tool or a divine instrument, you know? Um, in the beginning was the word, you know, and the word was with God and this this ability to, to name something and then to and then to be able to discriminate from one thing to another or one person to another is this mm. extraordinarily powerful tool and it and it has practical usage right so that's most of our education is some form of of honing that tool of discrimination um, 
how well it does that is a real question mark, I think. Mostly we learn how to regurgitate information that's taught to us. We're not often taught to, <laughs> to really discriminate really clearly, but um, nonetheless, we, that's part of the tool. But what we're not taught is this tool as for as powerful as it can be like cutting things open for you, opening new vistas of understanding. It has the equal and opposite ability to cut right back into you. And that's when we start to, to experience the shadow side. The most fundamental mm-hmm. shadow is that I am something separate from life. Right. And boy, in comparison to life, any of us as a human being seem to be almost infinitely small and vulnerable when we view life that way. And that therein lies one of the biggest shadow sides of the ability to con- conceptualize because we conceptualize ourselves first of all. And then we spread the conflicting goodwill onto the rest of <laughs> yeah. life and everybody. Conflicting goodwill yeah. is good, yeah. You know? And yeah. the funny thing is right underneath it, like hovering like a, a quiet presence that we, we try very hard not to notice, but it is there anyway. What hovers there in the presence of our being is the part of us that knows that we don't know. Like, oh, I think I'm da-da-da-da, or are you judge yourself. But somewhere deep inside, there's this sort of hovering acknowledgement, this, this kind of, um, this sort of etheric presence mm-hmm. that, that always, is always calling it all into question. Like, no, I know I'm not what I say I am. I know I'm not what I think I am. I know I'm not the image that I, that I put out there, nor the image that people reflect back to me. I know that, and yet nobody encourages us to really let ourselves know that we don't actually know. You know what I mean? We spend 20 years having it rammed into our heads. If you don't know, you fail the test. You yeah. get a bad grade. You, there's, and yet there is that, 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 like I said, that sort of presence inside of us that knows that we actually don't know. We don't know who we are. We don't know what life is. We don't know what God is. We don't know what happens after death. We don't know all of this stuff. And to me, real spirituality begins when we are willing to start to enter that door. Like, okay, what is it like to not know who I am? Let me start there. Let me start with being, as you said, I love, uh, the, I mean, you may not have used these specific words, but with being just honest. You know, for any of us to be honest with ourselves is very, very demanding for anybody. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do because mostly what we find out is, at least initially, is how little we actually know. You know, and that can feel really challenging. But later you realize it's sort of the the doorway to a whole lot of grace. Yeah. And just to say, for me, that uh, when people say, well, what, what did you get? Why did you go to India? Why did you do anything? You, well, I, you met Ramdas, okay. But, you know, the reality was that what I heard immediately was this level of honesty. <clears throat> that made me, okay, I can be honest. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You know, and that was such a huge thing. I mean, for many, many people who, you know, he, he's helped bring along over the years for sure. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, uh, I love this. That's thing. a great part of that story. I'm so uh, glad you, you shared that because I think that's essential. It, you know, if you come to a teaching, does this teaching allow me to be honest? Does this teacher allow me to be honest with myself? Does this, to me, that's what Sangha is. Sangha is those people where you can really be real, mm. where, you, where you don't have to pretend and you're still accepted. That, you know, that's, that's Sangha. So I think that what you're speaking about is, is so incredibly important. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Even, uh, I mean, we, Sangha is something that we emphasize big time through yeah. everything that we do. Uh, probably top thing that we talk about. You know, we have a fellowship program where we help people get together in different areas where they may not know people, so on and so forth. And, uh, and of course, when the Buddha was asked, so what is the most important of the three jewels? And 
it wasn't dharma right it was and uh it was sangha yeah right i mean yeah. I, th- I always thought that was so yeah. great yeah and, yeah well it's so important. we're social beings even a hermit like me is a social being <laughs> and we 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 need to we need to find ourselves or feel that we are in some sort of a safe social structure even if it's only with one person that's a safe social mm-hmm. structure you know and and i think and that sangha when that shows up you know and we can also i think it's good for us to remember that we can also be that for someone mm-hmm. someone else and mm-hmm. then we we become we participate in their in being their sangha of like you suggested like what we what's so important to us we need a foundation you know and i think sangha provides a kind of foundation otherwise things the inner experience you can just feel so chaotic that we have no ground to stand upon mm. um, that it can be really very challenging yeah. so i think that you get to the point that uh, you realize the uh, tyranny of uh, that ego thought and so on can be and of course the ego is a a terrible master, as they say, but could be a good servant, right? That's a great uh, way to put it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then, okay, wake up. We want to wake up. So let's talk a little bit about the waking up process. Now, obviously, what we just talked about, Sangha, Satsang, and being with people where you can be yourself and be authentic and be honest uh, is unparalleled in its uh, support. Not to mention, of course, sitting together, chanting together, whatever it is you may, if, uh, taking food together. Yeah. Very, you know, that's a, that's a big deal that we, we were told mm-hmm. uh, when we were kids back there with uh, Nim Karoli Baba. So, but steps to wake up, particularly in relation to the way in which we believe in that me, in these yeah. thoughts and so on. Yeah, well... So first of all, let me say that there are, there are lots of ways of going about this. So what I'm going to describe is just, just, just the way that I'll go about it if, if somebody asks me, right? Mm. But I'm always sensitive whenever somebody asks me about this is I want to know who they are. I want to know what their orientation is because it's not true that one size fits all. But mm. my, my sort of fallback orientation um, around this is I always focus right on identity. That's where I focus, right? Mm-hmm. Right, right, just bear right, it, right into that. And it's right there. And with, okay, like, first of all, you know, when we start to look into what am I really, if we're honest, which sometimes takes years, but if we're honest, we can come to very, very quickly, I don't know. When I really look, Oh, I, I guess I'm not my thoughts and my images and the, my beliefs. And, you know, I'm, that's a, I'm skipping over a lot of territory there that yeah. can take a long time to work through, but doesn't necessarily have to. It only depends on how honest we can be with ourselves of how long it takes. But right there, at a certain point, you start to see that all the ways you've defined yourself and other people have defined you isn't really you. No wonder it felt so inadequate all along. Right. Um, and uh, so right there, the first thing I'll ask people is, OK, since we're so conditioned to think we have to know, what I want to know is what's the direct experience of not knowing without the demand to know? Let's start there. Is it actually terrible to not know who you are? Now, if you're trying to know, it all of a sudden has, is conflictatory. But if you just let yourself not know, there's a, there's a ease. There can be like this incredible relief. Like it's not as bad as I thought it was. It's not the end of the line, of course, but I think to enter into the experience, the heartful experience of not knowing is a pretty open state of being. And from there, then we can really look, and this is where for me, inquiry and contemplation or meditation really go hand in hand, because the inquiry 
has to be contemplative. It can't simply be intellectual. Um, there's too much intellectual um, asking and not enough contemplation, I think, in a lot of sort of modern day non-duality. Uh, the, the contemplative element can somehow, sometimes be forgotten. The contemplative element, like I said, is always returning back to our experience of being. Our experience of being, right? What's my, and I can't, uh, and your experience of being keeps showing you that you can't find your total self or your total being through any idea, through any image, through any belief that there's always something more primary and more primary and more primary. And the funny thing that that which is most primary doesn't have a particular form and it's not distinct. It's not a distinct entity. You know, it's more like a presence than it is a person. More like that. I always like to say more like, so it's people that get stuck on the word. Yeah. And so that's where, I start, that's where I start. Like, let's, let's just start to intuitively feel into, into that, mm. right? Into that which doesn't seem to have a, a, particular, a particular shape, a t- particular weight. A pati- it doesn't seem to occupy duration. It doesn't seem to last for a little or a lot of time. It's, it's, it's very confounding to the mind but in experience, we can actually be feeling it and experiencing it rather quickly, actually, if we can simply be honest about our experience. Mm. And that's, that's the key. And that's the danger in, mo- in the modern spirituality is because we all have access to everybody's answer to these questions. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, well, you know, okay, I've heard that I am consciousness or I am awareness or I am God or and then we're, we start to look to find the answer, which really means we're looking to confirm a belief that we have instead of sticking with our actual experience. Like, can you forget wh- while you're doing it, while you're engaged in the practice, let's say, can you hold in suspension what everybody has said, the way other people's definitions? So can you actually enter into your own experience mm. like a little kid? You know, like, uh, because otherwise, something in us is corrupting the process because we're looking for an answer that we've already heard. You know, and yeah. I think if we can suspend that, n- not necessarily discount it, because it's not that it, it doesn't have some usefulness. It can orient us in a certain direction, right? Internally, but once we're oriented, I think then we have to let let go of the pointer. And I think this is the the sort of where, where, where this, mis, this strange paradoxical thing starts to happen where, where our, our willingness, or you could say even our will, our, our willingness and grace start to merge, right? Because we're not pushing for a result. We're actually looking into the nature of our immediate experience of being. Mm. Mm. Beautiful way to put it. This strikes me as something I'd mentioned before. Could we talk about that combination? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was with a yogi, and uh, I'm seeing a yogi in India recently, a jungle baba, and he brought us to a spot where he said, yeah, I just sat here for six months. Mm-hmm. It seemed like a good spot. I said, well, how do you, how you just do that? You have no idea that you will get fed. You will have food, mm-hmm. shelter, the things... <laughs> that that's right certainly we from the west count on mm-hmm. and how I, I don't remember if i said that, where do you find the courage to be able to sit to to be with in that primordial state of of, of mind and he said god's willpower mm-hmm. it's a great and, part. Yeah, I thought, wow, that's unique. So he, yeah. obviously, he's just aligning himself yeah. with, you know, there's no me, there's no, I, I, he let yeah. go of that. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I that, love that. That's a great way of articulating it. And I think it's a great question for anybody. Where, where, where do we go? What is that, what is that reference point that is, that is not us? Yeah. Where, where is our connection with that which is bigger than, than us as egos? 
and not just in a con concept, but what does that feel like when you reach that limitation of as far as you can take yourself, but then be kind of open, open-minded, open-hearted to some way that the numinous can present itself. And I think that's so important because that's spirituality, isn't it? It, it takes mm -hmm. us to that edge and it presents us with, at least in the beginning, it's a re I think it's a relationship. Later it may become more something more along the lines of fundamental identity, but I think it starts as a relationship to that which is bigger than myself. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's not necessarily um, um, totally kosher in, in, in modern non-duality to say something like that. But <laughs> But I'm always interested in, you know, what works rather than what fits yeah, yeah. to the party you, line. You may be a little bit of an unkosher Advaitist, mm. which is to me the only real Advaitist. <laughs> I didn't even know what the word Advaita until I'd been teaching for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, right. Until somebody yeah. told me that I was doing satsang and I said, what's that? And <laughs> That's great. I had never, I'd never right. heard it. I just experimented and, right. you know. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, although we're, we don't have too much time left, I, I did have to, uh, to, we have to talk about another thing, because um, you're talking this book, and we've been talking about grace, and uh, you have a little thing, love is the fierce embrace of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, just give us a little of your perspective on that. Well, it's, it's, there is a side of love, which is, of course, which is bliss and beauty and being held and the great ease of being that can come through some essential connectedness. And there's also the fierce side of love. And I think like Ram Das would kind of articulated this when he, I saw Ram Das at a conference I was speaking at just a few months after he'd had a stroke. Oh. And then he had a hard time talking. It took him yeah. a long time to say what he wanted to say. Um, and, but it was a beautiful time to be with him, you know, so, so open. It had obviously been such a profound event along with the challenge. But he articulated it at that conference, and I think he's continued to do so. He said, I was, my guru stroked me. <laughs> that this was sort of something, something sent by, by my guru or by life. And it was in some ways something that I needed. To me, that's the kind of fierce, fierce face of love. The fierce face is we get what we need, not necessarily what we want. And may we all get what we need much more than we get what we want. And sometimes that's, like I said, we feel held and comforted and it's, it's, it's ease itself. And sometimes it's, a fierce experience like a stroke or a death or you lose your job or you get left or you get ill or sick or something happens you know we don't look at those experiences and go well there's there's love coming to my aid but I think for most of us if we look back over the arc of our life however many years that may be I think almost all of us can look and see that we've actually come to our, our most evolutionary moments are generally were preceded by some of the most difficult and trying episodes of life. Not always, just often. Mm -hmm. And that's also sort of the fierce embrace of love. That's as if there's some force that is loving enough that it doesn't stop when we say, will you please stop? Yeah. It, again, it gives us what we need, but we only know that in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Relentless. I mean, I used to think of Maharaji and every day, it was just this relentlessness yeah. of, uh, uh, of someone who had no, nothing going on for themselves. It wasn't anything about, it was about yeah. getting everyone else free of suffering, free to be who they truly were. I mean, it's such a, yeah. the Buddha, the idea of the compassion. Yeah, well, this is the part that I don't think is our, 
talked about much in that I hear of. I mean, I'm sure it's there, but in a lot of modern spirituality, um, I think what often makes the difference is that lots of people have, let's say, significant spiritual experiences, however that may look. The truth of the matter is there's a relatively small percentage of those that it really becomes a, a in the, in the big scheme of their life, a really transformative thing that's living and vital and happening rather than an experience that once happened. And what I've seen is what, what makes the difference is how much we, uh, how, how willing we are to serve what we've been shown. Mm, you know, that, that I don't know of somebody that I think of is really deeply deeply awake that their life isn't in service to the very realizations that they've had. That doesn't mean they're all spiritual teachers. The vast majority of them that I know are not. They have more good sense than that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think this is, the, this is the element that's so necessary. Like you said, with Nareem Crowley Baba and so many of us, really, this wasn't a segmented part of their life. This was their life. This was their life. This is what they... This was what they were dedicated to, um, and it wasn't even about it wasn't about them, as as individuals. It was, it was about being in service to the grace that was given. And I, it seems to me that that's that's where the that's where that makes an immense difference in the quality of our life and how deeply deep our realization is going to be embodied through the imperfectedness of our humanity is how much we're willing to be in service to it yeah. rather than to remain a spiritual consumer <laughs> and just more experiences, more experiences, yeah. more experiences. Right. But Hey, how about if I went out today and in some way embodied and serve what I realized last week? Mm. Exactly. Just so start with okay. one thing today, one, one gesture, no matter mm. how small that seems like, a, a, seems like it embodies something, some significant insight that you've had. And then you start to discover, wow, this is, this is a whole different relationship with spirituality. It gets you out of the spiritual consumer mm -hmm. mode. You know, I yeah. think what Trumpa Rinpoche used to call spiritual materialism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, to me, the biggest antidote to this gigantic obsession with the me uh, is start thinking about somebody else that you can actually do one, as you say, small thing for. Yeah. It really does. That does change everything. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ser serve the world. Yeah. Serve the world. How, gosh, there's an innumerable ways to serve the world. And it doesn't today? have to. <laughs> yeah. To, that's what I always think of today. Pick, pick, pick a gesture today no matter how small yeah. and then we see like i mean what if i the only the only time that i was really committed to spirituality like when i was up on a stage talking or talking to you on a podcast or you know because then there's the other 23 hours of the day and i think the, those other 23 hours of the day those are those are just as significant as the the, the moments that seem significant mm. And maybe actually even more. Mm. Um, yeah, I, the older I get, maybe it's just becoming, you know, now I'm 55 and I don't know if it's age or what it is, but the older I get, the more that it's, the more clear it becomes to me um, that to be, into service, to be in service to what we've realized. Um, and that is some way of contributing, being a, a, a benevolent presence in the world is, is just, it can't be overstated how important that is. Mm. Now, just to, to, here's my little closing thing from you that's so wonderful, and that it is that what we're talking about right now, radiating love is what we can do. And you, uh, upon that realization in that little hut in your, uh, in your yard, and you say, I walked out of the hut, and everything I looked at was an expression of this love, a manifestation of this love. The whole universe was nothing 
but this immense, infinite love, which I was bathed in. And uh, I'm so happy to have met you today and be able to hang out a little bit in this love because it's just uh, wonderful. There's anything else I'd rather be doing. So really, I thank you. But before we go, I have to tell everybody that uh, we are wonderfully supported by 1440 uh, and they are the 1440 Multiversity. And for those of you who are listening to this podcast, you have an opportunity if you're from anywhere in the world, but certainly if you're on the West Coast near Santa Cruz, because Aja is going to be there in November. In fact, I'm going to go there this afternoon. What? I'm going to go there this afternoon because I'm going to, I, I was there about a year ago when they were still in construction. And since I'm going to be there later, I'm going to go see it in its more completed form. So I'll uh, be there in just a few hours from oh, now. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, what a beautiful uh, so, campus. Yeah, I haven't been there, but of course, oh. since we're uh, in this partnership with them, and I've seen, of course, pictures, and I've talked to so many people who have, yeah. and it's uh, an extraordinary uh, place that, uh, that they put together. And you are going to be there from November 9th to 11th, so plenty of time for people to register. Uh, go to 1440.org. So again, thank you so much, Adya. And uh, I hope we can do this again one of these days. And uh, and there's so much more. I mean, I could go on for hours, literally here. It was, it's just been wonderful to make your acquaintance, Raghu. And it's a, it's an honor to be, to be here with you. It's, it's really been lovely. Thank you so much. This is uh, the Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network, and we shall see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.